Hey everyone, welcome back to the How To Helisim series. Lesson 2, Hovering. Hovering is one of the hardest skills to learn in Helisimming. You have to address it right at the beginning, and you don't have the benefit of an instructor keeping the helicopter under control while you're gradually learning. In this lesson, we'll go over some tips and exercises to help you practice your Helisimming hovering skills. But first, we'll talk about some basic aerodynamic forces, coning and the Coriolis effect, gyroscopic precession, and translating tendency. This video is intended for entertainment purposes and flight sim only and not actual instruction in an aircraft. Just want to get that out of the way. All of this information can be found in the Helicopter Flying Handbook, which is a free publication from the FAA, which I recommend reading. I'm going to pull a few excerpts from the handbook and discuss a few of the concepts based on the information contained in the handbook. The handbook goes further and deeper into the aerodynamics and understanding of airfoils. What we care about in this lesson is that it is a rotorcraft and the airfoil rotates around the center mass. The basic aerodynamic principles that we want to discuss briefly are the opposing forces of lift and weight thrust and drag. The most important concept to keep in mind while learning to hover is that the lift component and the thrust component are the same. The blades are pulled outwards due to the centrifugal force of their rotation, but as you raise collective, they also start to pull upwards due to the lift created by increasing the angle of attack. This causes the rotor disc to create a cone shape. As the rotor disc cones, the blade tips move closer to the center of rotational mass, which actually causes them to speed up because of the Coriolis effect, or the law of conservation of angular momentum. Um, ice figure skating. Think of the, uh, the figure skater doing the spin, and as they draw their arms and legs in, they spin faster. That's what's happening with the rotor disc. The next topic to discuss briefly is gyroscopic precession. What gyroscopic precession is, is when the force is applied to a gyroscope and it does not react for an angle of 90 degrees. So when you look at the diagram, you apply the force at A and the reaction occurs at B. It's a, a, a gyroscopic force with all spinning um, masses. Now, the controls in the helicopter are rigged in a way that you don't have to account for this when you're moving the controls but it will, help your, it will help your understanding of why certain things occur when they do when going through aerodynamic transitions. It's because the effect is happening 90 degrees after it was applied. Another really important effect to understand in the hover is the translating tendency. Translating tendency is due to the tail rotor thrust from counteracting the torque of the main rotor. So, in a single rotor helicopter, you have to counteract the main rotor thrust once you have departed the friction of the ground contact of the skids. Um, you counteract that with the tail rotor thrust. And the tail rotor thrust actually pushes you sideways, and you have to counteract that drift of the tail rotor thrust. So we get what a situation, um, in a situation that's called uh, skid low. And in a counterclockwise system, um, like a Bell or a Robinson, you get a left skid low in a clockwise system like the Cabri, you get a right skid low. So when you actually lift off the ground, because of the translating tendency, the helicopter wants to drift to the left because of the tail rotor thrust, so you counteract it with a little bit of right cyclic, which causes the right skid to hang a little bit low. The last concept to discuss briefly is the pendular action and the delayed response. So because it's a single rotor helicopter, its mass is suspended from a single point location, so it acts as a pendulum, and the helicopter reacts after the pendulum action occurs. So there's a, a little bit of a delayed response in the way that the helicopter reacts, so you have to account for it, and you have to stay ahead of the aircraft. It's a lot to think about, and we definitely haven't covered everything. Refer back to the FAA's Helicopter Flying Handbook. I'll put a link in the description. Try not to let yourself get too overwhelmed by the amount of information in the handbook. 
you don't have to be thinking actively of these concepts at every second while you're learning how to hover. Just know that the main rotor is not a large vectored fan and that there's a little more to it going on. Hovering in the sim is very reliant on the visual picture and what you use for reference points. I like to use the compass. In most aircraft, it's in a very good place to be able to use it as a, a visual reference to other items or other things you can pick outside the cockpit. In this scenario right here where I've superimposed this, this set of video on top, um, I like to use the compass here and then I'm using the corners of the square pad and then I'm also using the hangers and tower um, out of the corner of my eye per or peripheral vision to also keep everything in line. So it's the changes in relation to each other, all of those items, um, what I call the sight picture. And that is what I'm using to understand what's happening with the aircraft. It, it eventually will just click. The more you practice, you'll start to understand how little changes in the attitude of the aircraft will move again by that pendular, that pendular action. So when you notice that the compass moves a little bit in relation to the ground reference that you're using below you, you make a corresponding change to the controls and it just takes a lot of practice. Another tip that will help in your hovering practice is to add a little bit of wind. It's not very realistic to have a scenario where there is no wind, so it's best to have a little bit of wind. Most flight schools have a limitation for new students. The flight school that I flew with had a 15 knot maximum. Um, for any student without an instructor, that had less than 80 hours. So that's actually fairly a fairly good standard. Anything over a 15 knot wind in an aircraft, a two-seater aircraft like this of this size, is pretty uncomfortable. It's very bumpy. So a 15, a 15 knot limitation actually makes a lot of sense. So set yourself up some wind. Um, I would say somewhere between five and eight miles per hour is, is a good wind to start with. It actually gives the helicopter a little bit of stability to have the nose pointed into the wind. KSBA Santa Barbara is a good airport to practice hover work. At the south side of the airport, there are parking spots that have a circle and a square that are perfect for practice. Like you've seen in the background of the video up to this point, practice picking up and setting down at each corner of the square facing the directions of the compass. Not only does this give you practice with your pickups and setdowns, but it also gives you a chance to practice hovering into different wind directions. Any airport that has similar pads will do, but it is preferable to have a circle and a square. Now using the circle, practice pointing the nose towards the center of the circle and hovering around the circle. You also want to do the same maneuver with the tail pointing towards the center of the circle. You want to keep your movement slow and controlled. Keep your ground speed slow, steady, and controlled. Keep your height above the ground controlled and constant. Once you've completed the circle with the nose into the left and the tail into the left, make the circle with the nose into the right and the tail into the right. Don't be discouraged when you're first starting out. It is very difficult to learn these maneuvers. Take your time, have patience. As you continue practicing and spending time developing these skills, you'll find that it becomes easier and easier to maneuver around these circles, easier and easier to land at the four corners, easier and easier to hover in one place, and you'll find that that one place gets smaller and smaller until you're just able to click in the hover and everything makes sense, and you'll feel the sense of accomplishment of hovering a helicopter. Thanks for watching. I hope you find these tips and techniques useful in your journey in learning how to helisim. Be safe, be kind, and I'll see you in the next video.